Hi, I'm Dr. Caroline Leaf and you're listening to Cleaning Up the Mental Mess, a podcast all about giving you simple and sustainable strategies to help you live your happiest, healthiest and most peaceful life. In today's podcast, I talk to an amazing guest, Dr. Paul Conti, Stanford and Harvard trained psychiatrist who has an excellent insight into trauma and the need for a biopsychosocial spiritual approach to understanding the root of trauma and how to manage it. He says, trauma fogs the mirror and distorts the window. We then can't see ourselves as we are and we can't view the differences of others as anything other than harmful. We dive into this as well as how can we manage this and change this. Before we begin, if you want to listen to my podcasts ad-free and have bonus content and live Q&As, then subscribe to my Patreon account. The link and the details will be in the show notes for that. And as always, as I say, this podcast is for educational purposes and is not medical advice. And if you need medical advice, please contact the appropriate medical professional. And now, on to today's podcast. Dr. Paul Conti, I am honored and I am so excited to interview. It's an absolute pleasure. You're phenomenal. Your book oh. is fantastic. I read this thinking, oh my gosh, I feel so happy and so validated in my approach. So thank you for agreeing to come on this podcast today. You're welcome. Thank you so much for having me. It's an honor to be here and I so appreciate it. Thank my you. pleasure. Thank you. Now, you are an absolute expert when it comes to trauma, and this is a conversation we just before we began, you and I were just having a little chat, and I've been a little concerned, not concerned, but kind of watching what's going on in the media at the moment, and there's a swinging between we overuse the word trauma, we underuse the word trauma, we're not validating PTSD correctly, and it's kind of got to the point of, you know, what is trauma? How should we use the word? And should we be saying it? Shouldn't we be saying it? And I know you and I both come from the angle of we should be trauma informed and there's different types of trauma and we need yes. to understand the different types and the different impact. So I'd love to begin with you just, you know, maybe diving in on this conversation and then we'll get into depth in your brilliant book. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. You know, I, I think that it is a problem when a word is used so much, right? It can, it can almost lose its meaning, right? Because there's not a, a sort of context to it. And I think the, the idea that, that, that trauma, we define it as, as if trauma is, if anything that overwhelms our coping skills, right? Overwhelms the systems inside of us that, that help us keep ourselves oriented and, and keep a sense of self. But right? if those systems in us are overwhelmed, then something has happened in us that is truly traumatic. And we see that because on the other side of real trauma, there are brain changes. So it, it's not just a sort of soft assertion or, or anything negative, you know, that happens to a person becomes trauma. Because of course we know that negative things in our lives, you know, setbacks, difficulties can build perseverance and strength and character, right? So it's not just that anything negative is trauma, right? But true trauma overwhelms the coping systems in us, and it leaves us different as we move forward. And we see that through the lens of brain science. So it's not a soft assertion, or it's not a, you know, it's, it's not a word that, that can have a shifting definition. If we define it through the lens of brain science, then we can, we can understand it. And we can also then be able to assess for it and be able to decide about treating for it and ultimately, ideally, preventing it. I love that answer. And the, the field that I've been in has been looking at mind brain body research for all these years and showing I, it's, it, back in the 80s, I remember one of my professors telling us the brain can't change and your patients with trauma or TBI, that's it, you've got to teach them to compensate. And I immediately said, I can't, I didn't, that can't be right. And I did some right. of the first neuroplasticity research in my field. And then mid 90s, right. we've got technology. And now we know, Dr. Conti, right. that the brain right. can change. And as you say, the impact of life on every aspect of our life on our brain and body is something that's undeniable and plays out in our behaviors. And you yes. really have written an incredibly brilliant and easy book to read. It's full, but it's easy Thank to you. read. Thank and you. I'd love you to just tell us a little bit about the book and what, you know, what made you write it. And you've even got Lady Gaga as a forward, did, did the forward because you treated her at one point. So maybe you could start there and just dive in a sure. little and tell us about why you wrote the book. Sure, sure. You know, I, I never set out to to be a trauma person, right? Or, or, or to like have that be my route of approach. But in 20 years of doing 
the work that I do, I just saw over and over and over that trauma and, and the, the changes in us, in our brains and the changes in us psychologically, how we see ourselves, how we orient to the world has flowed through so much of what I'm trying to help. Right. So it wouldn't matter, you know, someone presenting with depression or anxiety or addiction or feeling overwhelmed by life or whatever it may be. But when you when you sort of look at what's what's going on, right, what are what are the root cause, the root cause of what is uh, is ailing that person? Or, you know, in, in so many of us, including myself, that the root was the same, that that if you if you sit and talk with people about what is going on in them and what is at times making them not just miserable, right, but at times threatening their life, right, and you trace those roots back, the roots trace back to trauma. And and I think the world around us doesn't acknowledge this. You know, we I, I, I use this analogy a lot that we live in a world of healthcare that that wants to polish the hood when there's something going on in the engine, right? And and we look for these quick fixes and we just look for throwing medicines at things. I mean, there's got to be a reason why we, for example, use five times more medicines than say the Dutch population or, you know, populations where where there, there's not just a reflex to throw medicines at things. And, and we've sort of lost this idea of trying to understand people, right? And trying to understand what's going on inside of us and how does it affect us? And, and it was seeing that over and over and over. And also seeing that if we tried to get to the root of the problem and we, we identified trauma. And again, not in everyone, but in the majority of people that I have tried to help over years, right? We identify trauma. And if we go to that trauma and we really explore it and we explore how it changed the person, which often we're not aware of, right? Unless we look at it and explore it, that, that we get better. Right. So it, it's not, you know, it's not sort of philosophical. It's not esoteric. Right. It's, it's a very simple truth of how to understand and help people. And it applies to people across the board. Right. Which is which is how I, I think that I've been able to to say help a lot of the people I've helped and, and how I've been helped, you know, through my own psychotherapy. Right. Through, through being a patient and, and being helped. And I think it's how I was able to help Stephanie that that that, you know, she Stephanie Germanata, who is Lady Gaga. That, that she has been very public, that she has has trauma in her life and and but the, the changes in her and and sort of being able to understand that and to to ground to a true self and to look at the narratives that that come of trauma and how we can again take control of the narratives in our lives it's helped people across the board in all socioeconomic demographics and and yes it applies to stephanie who i'm so grateful has written the forward for my book it applies to her it applies to me it applies to so many people that I've been able to help over the years or seen helped by good clinicians over the years, or just seen helped by, by trying to get a handle on themselves and their narratives. And, and it was that that drove me to, to write the book. I mean, it's a lot of, as you know, right, it's a lot of time and effort and there's a lot that goes into it. And I think, you know, for me, at least, there's got to be a passion inside about it in order to be able to bring that effort to bear. And that effort really came through the lens of seeing this is so important and just so underrecognized. We all know that what we eat can impact our mind and brain health, which is why my family always tries to look for new tasty and interesting foods that taste great and are nutrient dense. This is why I love Emmy, the world's first low carb, high protein and 100% plant based instant ramen. Each serving of Emmy has 21 grams of protein, 19 grams of fiber and only 6 grams of net carbs. It's also non-GMO and is 35% lower in sodium versus traditional brands which leaves you full and satisfied without the post and bloating and thirst. It is also really convenient if you have a busy schedule like myself. Emmy is super easy to prepare in the microwave or stovetop and you can have a bowl ready in just 7 minutes. My personal favorite Emmy is Tom Yum's shrimp flavored plant based ramen which has been keeping me warm and satisfied this winter. Emmy is also proud to offer a 100% happiness guarantee so you can try Emmy risk free and decide for yourself if Emmy is worth it. If you're not happy with your Emmy, they will offer you a full refund within 30 days of purchase. Visit emmyeats.com forward slash Dr. Leaf to try Emmy's delicious low-carb, plant-based and fiber-rich ramen. That's emmyeats.com forward slash Dr. Leaf. The link and details will be in the show notes. Oh goodness, I'm so glad you said what you said. And that's, you know, it's so Thank true you. how you speak about getting to the root of the issue 
And you describe so beautifully now and also in your book about how the current system is all about, you know, identify the symptom and treat the treat the 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 issue. And we've lumped the whole experience of life into the medical model. And yes, we have to right. deal with the impact on the brain and the body. There's thank goodness for medicine for that. But that's not dealing with that's that's the polishing of the hood. We have to deal with that, but we right. have to look at the story that brought us into that situation in, in the first place. And you comment right. on the healthcare systems failed us in that way. You commented yes. on the fact that you can't just throw medicine and you know, 10 sessions of CBT where you're just trying to take that thought and not deal with where it comes from, but just replace it. You can't just yes. put a Band-Aid. You have to right. actually deconstruct and reconstruct and find the source of that problem. Yes. So, and, and, I, and that's vital. It's vital component. So you, and I know your story because yes. and, and, I've heard it, but I'd love my audience to hear your own story of how you were in another field and you went, had a fairly okay upbringing and then you had a major trauma, traumatic event and then you kind of, you changed profession from what I understand, you went in another direction and landed up doing yes. what you're doing. Could you yes. tell us your story and how you got here? Yes, yes, yes. Thank you, thank you. That is in my own life. You know, I I, I came to understand in retrospect, right, how much trauma had impacted me, and and I understood that in part because I, I didn't have major trauma in the first part of my life, right, right until my mid twenties or so, and and I had a business career at the time, and the career was going well, and and there were a lot of things that I liked about it, but but I also wasn't happy, right, and and I, I had a whole set of thoughts about changing my life and going in a different direction, and and also felt like I couldn't do that, right, like I felt like I was too old to make the change, and like all these things that I felt while in my mid twenties, right. It was a, a huge trauma that that really ground everything to a halt for me when I, I lost my brother, my youngest brother, who had chosen to end his life by suicide, which was a, a, a terrible and tremendous shock. Th thank you to to me and to my family. And and you know what happened after that is is I, I just had this whole different set of thoughts and ideas that instead of thinking that. You know that I, I was a person who could maybe make an impact on the world, who could who could apply himself and have good things come back in return, right? Who who you know for whom the, the world was a place that would let me navigate, right? Let me make my way forward. I started to have a whole set of different thoughts, and you know they were they were thoughts of feeling ashamed, right? That that like I didn't know this, that it was it was my fault that it happened, and you know I should have I should have seen, I should have known, I should have done something different, and and thoughts that like oh we're we're all cursed and. I'm cursed and my family is cursed and, 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 you know, and, and, and you know, my mood changed and my sleep changed and my self care changed. And, you know, was fortunate to have really good people around me. And, and I just sought some psychotherapy, which is not something I'd ever done before, or, you know, even something I felt comfortable doing. Right. And, but I sort of went and did it in part out of desperation and, and, you know, I, I, it really brought to light how much had changed in me because of, the trauma that happened. And, and it reminded me that, oh, like you've forgotten this, it's who you were. And, and, you know, my life was going down a path that wasn't so healthy. I was drinking more than I should. And I was kind of doubling down on the unhappiness, you know, and it was through that, that I realized that, oh, like I, I can do something different. Or I don't, I, I don't want to, I can't lose myself in this. Right. And it really emboldened me to then go and do things that I didn't feel that I maybe could do, right? So in a sense, there was something sort of traumatic about being in a situation that wasn't the right one for me, but not feeling empowered to change it. But it hadn't risen to the level of, of the shock of the loss of my brother. And it was the shock and all the changes in me, including the ones I didn't recognize until I went and got some help that let me realize, oh my goodness, like I have to find again myself and my grounding and my footing and make decisions in a way that I choose to. And it was that empowerment that led me to you know to say look I, I can I can do what I what I choose to do right even if I'm taking some chances in doing it and to leave a good job and leave a good career path and you know and and I ended up going back to college for a year because I didn't have any pre-med classes and you know and then and then starting on this different path that led to to medicine but it was the the shock of the trauma and the shock of realizing the changes in me that led me to do that and then of course as I then became a psychiatrist and saw like okay, this is what's happening in, you know, in so many people who after trauma, then lose their anchoring to who they are, right? And then start to have a different life narrative without realizing that, the, that their sense of self and that their life narrative and their sense of possibilities has changed.
Wow. Wow. That is so well said. Well, wow. What is, what is an incredible story and how you turn that, you know, I love the part where you actually say how you recognize the changes, you became aware of them. And as hard as it was, you sought the help and that right. helped you to see the root cause and you basically reconstructed your life. So the story is still there. It's still painful to talk about your brother, but it doesn't, you haven't got lost in the pain. You've actually taken right. that pain and you've moved forward and transferred right. that pain over to now understanding what you were going through, how you were helped, then studied that. And now you're using that to help others and touch other people's lives, which is an incredibly beautiful story of humanity of what we should be doing Thank and of how you. we should be transforming and changing and how anyone that people, that we, it's hard as it can be with help. We can do these things. We can you know, edit what life has thrown at us and, and move forward, which is incredibly beautiful. Well, I want to talk, I want to quickly you. talk about something and then I'd love to go into the depth of, I think what's going to help people a lot, because this is how I what really got me. I was really, really validated when I saw this in your book about the different types of trauma, because that's kind of how I explain it yes. too. And I love, love, love how you explain it. But before we do that, Thank I read you. an article this morning and I sent it over to you just before we started. And yes. it made me so excited that I'm just going to read out and I'd love your, your just to comment on this. The WHO sure. and United Nations join calls to transcend the medical model. And basically what they're saying is the United Nations Special Rapporteur called for a move away from drug companies supported biological explanations of human distress in 2019. And then they recently echoed the United Nations, in a, the World Health Organization recently echoed this in another report calling for a fundamental change in mental health services. So going beyond just polishing the hood, as you said. And the report emphasized, and I'm so thrilled about this, social determinants of mental health, such as violence, discrimination, poverty, exclusion, isolation, and unemployment. In other words, we have to consider the person's whole story and their context right. and not just throw the medications and the 10 CBT sessions and individualize the issue. And although you experience yes. that as an individual, you experience the environment as an individual, and you've got to help the individual with the medical impact that it's had and to go to the root cause, at the same time, we have to not let them feel the shame of thinking it's they are broken brain. They've got a neuropsychiatric brain disease. There's something wrong with them. It's an impact right. of what they have gone through. So to see right. this on a global scale now as being a shift is such yes. an exciting thing because as we both know how things started, this shift towards a very neurocentric approach has been traveling, has been going on for the last 40 odd years. So maybe we're right. now starting to shift back to the story model. Right. So I right. love your comments. Oh, I, I find that to be so validating and so hopeful. I mean, we, we don't get a lot of hopeful news, you know, these days. And, and this is, I think, is a piece of hopeful news because I think the medical model has really become, I think, in, in, certainly in the United States and I think in many other places, it's really become just the medication model. Right. And, and like that is such a dumbing down of what's actually going on in people. I mean, if you think of what is the gold standard approach of a biopsychosocial spiritual approach, right? The bio part acknowledging that, okay, even think of the validation of the biological part that, oh, the trauma that overwhelms our coping mechanisms leaves us changed as we go forward. And we can determine and validate that by scientific measures, right? There are, there are the cutting edge of nerve neuroimaging shows us this. The cutting edge of, say, epigenetics shows us this, right? And the idea that I interviewed Darren Richarder, who's a trauma expert and a professor at Stanford in the book, and, and Darren talks about how, like, there was, an, I, it was at one point a, a thought that, oh, that, like, rape is a tool of war is a, is a, it's a one-time event, like a, a bad thing happened at a certain time, right? right? As opposed to, to, to what we now understand is that changes people, right? And it changes generations that now the genes and the, whether the genes are active or not, that a person transmits, it could be years later are impacted by that event. I mean, what greater validation can we have of trauma, right? And the impact of trauma on us biologically. So, so we can use the biological aspects to validate the truth of all of this and to understand routes of approach, which sometimes involve medication, for example, right? There's just one aspect of it, right? But so we, if we see it that way and allow it to help us, right? In, an, in an acute, sorry to interrupt, but in an acute situation, so the person can just get through the immediate moment, but in the chronic way, it's been used it's a bit questionable because it's like the solution. So I didn't want, I just wanted people to understand. Yeah. I don't know if, if, in terms of the acuteness of the situation, medication can certainly take the edge off, but it's not the solution. 
Right. There's a role for all of it. Right. But if we if we're just throwing medicine, we're, then we're making no use of biological understanding. Right. We're not using it. And then we're not then using it to transition to the psychological, the sociological, the spiritual. Right. Which is which is where the help. That's how change really happens. Right. It comes through understanding Wait, what has happened to me. Right. How how has it changed my conception of myself? How has it changed my conception of the world? Can I understand myself differently? Right. Have I as somewhere lost my grounding to what is true about me? I write in the book how th there's a map that we that we sort of often will have about ourselves, right? Of like, I think I know who I am. I know where I want to go. And we'll see this in people at hopeful stages of life, right? And after trauma, we can forget that, right? We can forget what we, what we knew was true about us, what we wanted for ourselves and for the future, right? And if we understand ourselves and we can find and address trauma at its roots, right? The, the psychological impact upon us, how to take back control, the impact of us in societies, right? And how societies can facilitate or prevent trauma. And ultimately, there's a spiritual aspect of it too, that, that how we are, we are in a sense, the same boat together, right? And, and we have to pay attention to the world around us, whether it's, it's climate change or it's how we handle violence, how we handle interpersonal distress, how we communicate with one another, that if we look at the richness of it, the biological, the psychological, the sociological, the spiritual, we know that that's the gold standard, but we've somehow dumbed it down to a medical model. That's not even a medical model, right? It's just a take an inventory of symptoms, which is what the DSM is, right? It's a, it's for, it's a tax, it's an instrument of taxonomy, right? It takes an inventory, right? But if we say, okay, let's just take an inventory of symptoms. Ah, I think it maps to this, right? And if it maps to this, which there's no life in it. It's just an inventory, right? Exactly, it's, it's not, a description. It's, 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 Right. That's all. And it's, it's one aspect of description. It doesn't tell you what's, what something truly is or isn't, right? No, nothing say, about oh, the story or environment or context right. or circumstance or anything. Right. So if all we're going to do is take an inventory of symptoms and map it to something that doesn't actually tell you what's going on, then of course we just end up at throwing medicines at something, right? Which is why people don't often, very often don't get better, right? I can't tell you how many people I've seen who've had, for example, five residential stays, right? For say for addiction, right? Five, and no one has taken a trauma history, right? So no one realizes, oh, all of all of the problems, the depression, the anxiety, the terror, right, that led to the substance use and led the person to then relapse after the residential stay is rooted in something that happened to them. And after that, something, everything changes in them. And that's when all the problems start, right? But no one, no one thinks to ask that, right? And, and this is really the standard in the world around us. Taxonomy of the DSM is actually blocking our ability to see a person's story. Because they've right. got so caught up in the symptomology as a and the treatment of the symptomology as opposed to you know what's actually under the hood and what's going on as you use that analogy. So and and you right. know the DSM five is about to come out in March and it's apparently got five hundred and something. So it's expanded the the taxonomy is expanded now to over five hundred and forty odd something like that different so called disorders. Yeah, which is which is remarkable. I mean, you, you now have an extreme, you know, a gigantic book that if you look through it, will give every one of us, you know, a bunch of diagnoses, right? Without any validity or any life to, to to what that really means in a person's life, and and it's time to look at that for what it is. That it is, it's an instrument that can help research, right? And it can say, oh, okay, we can communicate by by taking the inventories, and then it helps it helps do research. It helps communicate, but the idea that Somehow that is, you know, what people will call it the Bible, right? to refer to it like a religious text, right? When all it is is an instrument of taxonomy so leads us astray. And it fits with this idea of just take an inventory of symptoms and then that inventory could ping, okay, this is the medicine to use or that's the medicine to use. And it's, it's remarkable how misleading that is. It leads us away from understanding people. It leads us away from being helpful to people. And I think there's so many people out there who are trying to be and wish to be good clinicians, but are working in systems. And how do people work in systems where you have 15 minutes to try and see and understand a person? I mean, how close are we to just vending machine medicine of like tap in your systems and being in a medicine will pop out. And then look, I mean, it's just so clear that our mental 
health as the population is declining. I mean, it's, it's, it's indisputable. You look at the, the opiate epidemic and how many lives have been lost and the despair that we see around us and the rising rates of suicide in the, in, across the population and everything that we've suffered through the pandemic, isolation and violence behind closed doors. And, and you, you know, we, we, we look at, uh, the helping systems around us, and they've so clearly failed us. And and I think it's it's indisputable that this model and the way that we're handling, that we're, we're trying to handle mental health is, you know, it, it's so focused on throughput, right? And it's so focused on the superficial that we we lose our ability, and there's often no help to be had. Right, that even people who have insurance, I mean, they they can't find someone to sit down and 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 actually help them. And ultimately, even if we just look through the lens of dollars and cents, which is like obviously not the right way to do it, but so many of our systems are doing exactly that. Right, it doesn't help that we become like sort of penny wise and pound foolish. Right, where where you know we we don't invest in in the human mechanisms of helping. Right, and then. And then we we allow the furtherance of illness. So how many people who don't get the help that they need then are hospitalized, right? And they're hospitalized how many times? They can't take care of themselves. And then they have how many medical problems? We, we know that more than half of complaints people present to to physical medicine physicians, right, are coming from, from mental health places or coming from distress inside of them. I mean, what yeah. is the cost in terms of withdrawal right? from psychotropics or the, the side effects of psychotropics that have been unmanaged? Or may not sure. manage properly or whatever. So. Sure, between heart disease and, and you know, not being able to take care of one's diabetes. I mean, there's so many medical problems and, and medication related problems and addiction problems. It's like we spend billions of dollars right, on, on all of that. And if we if we just looked at wait, what is the, the what's actually going on here, we would spend far less resources and we would help people far more. But we're so busy in looking at, you know, What's the bottom line today and how much throughput can we have tomorrow that we're missing the big picture and people are dying because of this and, and lots of people. I mean, that's not an exaggeration or catastrophizing. It's exactly what's happening. And if you're in the field, you see it over and over and over again. Oh, all the helping systems failed that person and now they're dead. And that's it. That, that's the end of the story, right? There's no follow-up then of like, how do we understand that better? How do we change that? And, and it, it's, you know, it's tragic and it's playing out in such a big way that we can intervene in and change. And that's really the message of the book, which is it's, it's, it's meant to be read by anyone who chooses to pick it up. It's meant to be engaging and it's meant to describe ways in which we can help ourselves and others today. Right. Because the ways of understanding this and making things better are not rocket science. Right. Even though the science can be cutting edge and all of that, the, the actual means of how do we make change in ourselves and in others? How do we stop today and, and do a better job of understanding ourselves? Right. It's it's not that difficult or that complicated. And, and I mean, for the book to 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 paint a, a clear steps that we can all take and take today to make a difference. Wow, that is so beautifully said. I, and, and so necessary, such an incredibly important message that I 100% resonate with. And, you know, there's, there's two angles I quickly want to go down here, and the what, three, three angles, so that we can get, get people some help. I want to talk about, it's not that difficult, I want to talk about what we can do, but I'm going to say that that's the third part. The second part, second part I want to talk about quickly defining the different types of trauma, but I want to begin with just um, emphasizing the fact that we have almost made the stigmatization worse with the medical model. The bio, as, as the the United Nations report says, we've gone bio, bio, bio right. versus biopsychosocial spiritual. Yes. Even though we talk theoretically about bias, biopsych, yes. biopsychosocial spiritual, we're doing bio, bio, bio. When I say we, not you and I, the system. In the attempts to put out all these public campaigns to try and decrease stigma and say you have an illness like diabetes, it's actually increased stigma. That's the one thing I wanted you to comment on. And the other thing in that in this first chunk of information is there's those the study that they began a huge study in '96 and between that we ran through to 2014, 2015. I actually talk about that in in my book where the federal data showed that the people are dying eight to 25 years younger from lifestyle diseases and a lot of it's pointing to how we're managing our lives 
And that was pre-pandemic. So we already hit the pandemic with everything you've just described. And the solutions we've been offering have not worked. The bio, bio, bio model has not short as made it worse, basically. And we've got to go back to the whole lifestyle, the whole person, the context, everything we've been saying. So just to, so that was just to emphasize what you're saying, that there's actual research showing what you've just described so, in, so eloquently. There is Thank so you. much research to back that up and that we have to make the change, and we're going to talk about that in a moment. But then also to, to just to, to – would you like to comment on, on that before we dive into what the types of trauma are and what we can do? The dangers of the, the bio, bio, bio model is, right, that, that it, what it ends up doing is reducing people to numbers, right, the number being the diagnosis, and then describing how people have failed medicines, right? So to hear, you know, I hear people describe, oh, that's a 300.02, 296.33 who's failed such and such medicines, right? And it's like, we're talking about human beings here, right? And and we, we then lose our ability to help people. So it's, it's no surprise that our health as a population has declined. I mean, with our increased interconnectedness in so many ways, it brings good things, but it also can bring negative things, right? And we have, we have social problems, we have economic problems, we have so many problems that are pervading through the population, and we're doing a worse and worse job of, of helping ourselves as a population. So we see that that was in a very, very bad place before for the pandemic, which has driven all of that to be worse. So, so I think that, that part is very clear. People don't always realize that physical symptoms like headaches, teeth grinding, and even digestive issues can be indicators of stress. And let's not forget about doom scrolling, sleeping too little, sleeping too much, under eating and overeating. Personally, when I'm stressed, especially when I have a lot on my plate and feel overwhelmed with work, I tend to get bad stomach aches and headaches, which can really impact the rest of my day and even my relationships. It's so easy to snap and get annoyed when you're in pain, especially if you don't communicate how you feel to your loved ones. Stress shows up in all kinds of ways, and in a world that's telling you to do more, sleep less and grind all the time, here's your reminder to take care of yourself, do less and maybe try some therapy. I find that talking to someone I trust is one of the best ways to manage toxic stress and therapy is another great way to do this. BetterHelp is customized online therapy that offers video, phone and even live chat sessions with your therapist. So you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. It's much more affordable than in-person therapy. Give it a try and see if online therapy can help lower your stress. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp. And cleaning up the mental mess listeners get 10% off their first month at betterhelp.com slash code. That's B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P dot com slash code. Just very quickly on the stigma that's increased in the attempt to decrease, I believe we've actually increased because now people are too scared to say that they've got it. On one hand, they're saying I've got a brain illness, accept it like diabetes. But on the other hand, that's impacting, oh, there's something wrong with you. So there's a lot of conflict inside a person right. and society right. about what's the right way to explain this and say things. And the research shows right. it's made the stigma worse. Right, right. Because we don't normalize that. that look, we, we all have mental health issues. I mean, look, look there, there, it's like sometimes... Sometimes we can have a mental health problem, right? Something that really is a problem and and warrants clinical attention. Like after the loss of my brother, I had a mental health problem, right? That was a real problem that would that that threatened my ability to navigate my life forward, right? Right. So okay, so I'm fortunate at this moment that I don't have a salient problem, but I certainly have mental health issues, right? We all do, right? And and if we look to this book that 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 ultimately we want to use to pathologize all of us by giving all of us a bunch of numbers, right? Like it's, it's not helpful. It's pathologizing. I mean, as opposed to saying, look, we all have issues that can warrant being addressed and some of them may be smaller and some of them may be greater. Right. And, and if it's get if, if there's a, something going on that's rising to the point where, where it's like changing how you're interfacing in the world, you feel different, right? Your mood is lower. Your enjoyment is lower. Your anxiety is higher. You're having panic attacks. You're having problems sleeping, right? Like how about getting help for that, right? And if there was a system that said, ah, I'm going to take stock of what's going on in you, 
right? Let's talk about what's going on in you and let's try and help you, right? Like that would be very, very different, right? Than the idea that, hey, they're very limited helping resources. And, and if you come to get help, right, you, you may see someone or likely to see someone who's so overwhelmed that they have little time to even make eye contact, right? As you're going to take an inventory of symptoms, tell you what your number is, right? That's your number. That's your diagnosis, right? And throw some medicines at you. Oh, and then, you know, and people often will think, that doesn't seem like that's going to work, right? And on the other side of it, so if you already kind of feel that, and then on the other side of it, right, which a lot of people go through, now you've failed this medicine, failed that medicine, and they want to throw another medicine at you. I mean, how dis- disheartening is that? No, it's right? terrible. It's disheartening. Do you want to do, talk about the change first or quickly define the different levels of trauma? Because there's, I think that's so important for people to understand. Because like you said it beautifully now, True. you can have, we all have mental health issues and sometimes they become a problem. And in our, in our life, it's, even that's okay. It doesn't mean that there's some, that you're crazy. It just means that life can become can go from an issue to a problem, but we all have issues. I love that definition. So now let's talk about the different acute trauma, chronic trauma. Very, if you wouldn't mind sure. briefly identifying those, and then let's sure. end with what can we do? Sure, sure. The, the, I can quickly say the three areas of trauma. So the, the idea, remember, so... So trauma rises to the level, we can use the word generally, but trauma in the clinical context, right, is is something that rises to the level of overwhelming our coping skills and changing us as we go forward. And that something can be acute or chronic or vicarious. And acute is the the clearest one to describe, right? It's something that happens, right? And and then it's it's overwhelming and things are different. So, So combat trauma, which is a lot of how we see trauma is through the lens of what happens in, in, in combat or a car accident, the loss of a loved one, an assault, right? It's an acute trauma that acutely overwhelms us and there are brain changes that come from that. Right. But that same scenario can come from chronic trauma. So chronic denigration, right, based upon things like race, socioeconomic status, religion, gender identity, sexuality. Right. These are things that that can lead a person to go through life where, where society is chronically or constantly telling them that they are less than. Right. And the accumulation of that over time can change the brain in the same way that acute trauma can change the brain. Right. So so there's acute trauma, there's chronic trauma and vicarious trauma that fortunately, thank goodness, right, we are blessed with empathy, right, that we have the ability to feel other people's sadness and other people's despair. And that's a wonderful thing. But it also paves the way for vicarious trauma. And vicarious trauma is the experience of something that that uh, someone else has experienced. So, so people, you know, you see people with the same changes in them as, that acute trauma can bring because they're so they're sort of glued to the constant feed of of terrible things that happen in the world around us, right? And then there becomes an inability to say turn away from it or it just coming at us, right? And then it decreases a person's sense of security in the world and sleep and mood start changing. And they have the same brain changes. So, so, so there's there's a truth to it that we see through the mechanisms of science that say yes, that is different, and we can all get there through acute, chronic, or vicarious ways. Excellent. Thank you so much. That's absolutely superb, helpful, and so helpful. All right. So now, what can we do? And I know that's a huge thing, and I know they can go to your book. But and and I'd love to have you back on to dive into the second part in more depth. But for now, can we, can you give us, because you said it's not that difficult to change. And that was a very hopeful statement that I immediately latched onto. So could you talk around that statement? Sure, sure. The, the, there are a lot of antidotes in the book where I, I, I try and write, like, like, here's a clear thing that someone can do. And they, and they flow through, through the book. I'll, I'll, I'll highlight maybe one, I'll highlight one of them that I think is, is a really helpful thing that, that anyone can do today. Right, is we can all stop and take stock of what's going on inside of us, right? Like, what's the narrative that we're telling ourselves? What's our internal dialogue? What are we saying to ourselves, right? When we're alone, what are we thinking about, right? When we're driving from one place to another, right? What's going on in our head? What are we saying to ourselves? And and to to stop and take stock of what's going on inside of us, or to ask someone else, right? You know, if you know someone went through something a couple months ago and they seem different, right? To to, to stop and, and since talk to ourselves or to someone else about, hey, what's going on inside of us? It's remarkable what the doors that that can often open. 
right? And and how we can learn, like, oh, I'm saying to myself, I mean, so many of us have have a very negative self-narrative, right? As we're going through life, you know, we're, you know, we're saying things to ourselves that we don't want to, you know, like, you know, I, I can't remember before doing a, 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 some th- therapy around this, right? I would, I would see that, you know, if I drop my keys, you know, it's, oh, you know, you're an idiot, right? Or, you know, or, or something doesn't, didn't go well professionally and, oh, you know, you're incompetent, right? And, and this idea that like a lot of us have a, a narrative inside of us, right? That, that can be a very oppressive narrative and it can come from a lot of places, right? I mean, you know, sometimes it can, it can come from being, you know, from, from say, early childhood experiences, right? If someone has had, has had traumatic early childhood experiences and they sort of carry with them an oppressor, right? Or if things have happened to us that, that make us feel like we're not good enough, right? The world has put those ideas into us, right? So stopping and, and taking a look at like, what's going on inside of me? Like, what am, what am I saying to myself, right? Or, or stopping and talking to another person, right? About what's going on inside of them if we're concerned about them or so that something has happened with them and, and no one's talking about it, right? This often happens is that we, we are in groups, whether they're family units or their work settings or their friends, friendship settings, right? And, and you know, we, we don't stop and talk about what we're feeling inside and what's going on inside of us. And it's, you know, it's, it's remarkable to just stop and think about what's going on inside, which is often the first step clinically, right? Of sitting with someone and saying, wait, how, you know, what's, when you're just sitting, you know, in, in a place, what do you say to yourself? And, and it can often open up so much about the narratives inside of us because traumatic trauma inside of us and the changes it makes changes our narratives, right? And, and, and if you think, what are you saying to yourself now? after after trauma perhaps right and is that different from what you were saying to yourself before trauma right i mean none of us is born with with a narrative inside of us that we're not worth anything and we can't take care of ourselves and we can't get a better job and no one's ever going to love us and we can't be a good parent like where does that come from right you know it, it, it comes from things that have happened along the way after we were born right and and we can we can take stock of that and we can see ourselves not just through a lens of compassion right but through a lens of compassion and through a hopeful lens of change right and and sometimes it starts with changing the our, our the narrative inside of us so so i think there are, there are a lot of of antidotes and steps and some of them are more simple than that relaxation strategies so we can get better sleep right you know how do we find helping resources in a world that doesn't have a lot of them right but i think looking at what we're saying to ourselves it's a key starting point. It's something we often don't do unless we're kind of prompted or we think like, ah, it, it would be helpful to me to do that. Sensate is a sophisticated infrasound resonance device that, when paired with the sessions in Sensate Companion app, works towards toning your vagus nerve, reducing stress and improving well-being. The device emits infrasonic sound waves that are synchronized with the soundscapes in the app to provide deep relaxation in 10 to 30 minute sessions. Sensate not only works towards releasing stress and anxieties in the present moment, but it also increases your stress resilience over time, improves your heart rate variability, and helps with better quality sleep, among many other benefits. After just a few minutes, I found that I was in an enhanced state of relaxation and drifted off into a much deeper sleep right after use of the Sensate. And just for my listeners, get $25 off each Sensate with code Dr. Leaf. Just visit GetSensate.com and use code Dr. Leaf. The link and details will be in the show notes. And the objective of that, I love this so much. It's really, it's such a similar approach to it. Basically what I do, do as well and with with the systems that I have developed and approaches in, in therapy so I just but I love how you verbalize it and it's it, it, it's taking what you say a lot of in your book is taking it to the root so once you know what you're saying about yourself that's coming from somewhere and that's right. where the trauma bit comes in because right. if it's really a lot of harsh self-critical whatever that's leading to the spiral of shame it's coming from somewhere and right. I think that's what you that's what I, from reading your book and, and listening to you that's where you're trying to help people is to get to that root cause of why are you saying this about yourself and how can we look at this, the antidotes? How can we have another way right. of looking at that? Right. And I think I would summarize that by saying trauma reflexively creates shame. Thank you. I wanted to ask you about the shame, but because you talk a lot about trauma and shame. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Trauma creates shame 
in us. And, and if, if I stop and think like, how did I feel right at the loss of my brother? Right. It's very clear to me, even all this time later is I felt ashamed, right? I felt ashamed that I didn't know that I didn't see. Right. And I see that over and over and over again, that there's, there's a, a reflex that cr- it creates shame in us. And then if we don't look at that and, 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 and we're not aware of that, then the shame drives the narrative. Right. Which is why if I, you know, I mean, how many times have I sat with someone who says sexually assaulted. Right. And then and then is telling a story of how it's their fault. Right. I mean, we see it over and over again, even if it's like it's so clear from the outside. Like, oh, my guess something terrible has happened to this person and it was not their fault. And what they need is compassion. But they, they're, they're blocking themselves from compassion because the reflexive shame then wants to build a story. Right. And you see this with things that 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 from the outside, it was so easy for other people to see that the loss of my brother wasn't my fault. I didn't see that. Right. Right. And just as someone who say is assaulted doesn't automatically see that. Right. It's the shame that then comes to the surface and we create stories and you can see how that then changes the narrative. Right. And, and that's part of what when we're really connecting with people, that's why if we stopped and, and we're just throwing medicines and numbers at people with sometimes and how much money in an emergency room stays and hospitals with so much that happens. If we so sat invalidating. And we, it's so invalidating. It costs lives. It's a terrible misuse of resources. And if we sit and we talk with someone about, look, let's talking about the trauma and, and what the trauma, not that meaning everyone has to relive every detail of it. That's often no, not no, the case. No, no, there's different ways of but, people handling it, yeah. Right, but talking about what is it, what has it changed in you, right? You know, what, what, how do you feel afterwards and start to look at that and, and, and like what really seen, what, what really makes sense? I mean, how many people would say, I would never feel that way about someone else, right? But what we feel that way about ourselves, right? So let's ground to that and harness some of that logic and compassion and integrate it with ourselves. And, and often that's how people are better, right? Uh, so, so often a little bit of introspection, discussion, psychotherapy, that kind of thing can make a tremendous difference. And so often we're not doing that. And then it's really the shame and the despair and the fear and all the things that that the cascade that comes from the shame that are then driving us to terrible places. And it just doesn't have to be that way. I write in the book, how trauma doesn't have to be in the driver's seat, right? And often that's what happens to us. And, and we can realize, wait, I don't want to be in the back seat. And, you know, trauma is driving me who knows where, Right. And we can then we can take back control that way. Oh, this is incredible. Dr. Conti, I have to ask you to come back again sometime for a part Thank two you. so we can take Thank this you. concept even deeper. Because I just as, you. as you're saying that, I'm thinking this is something that I've you've probably thought about before. And I've, I've commented a lot on this sort of thing. Health and in, health plans, insurance plans should be covering endless amounts of therapy. At this stage, most most health plans, it's quite difficult to actually get them to cover any kind of psychotherapy or any kind of therapy. And when they do, it's limited to maybe 10 sessions. So that's really shooting themselves in the foot because the bio model is taking away from the biopsychosocial spiritual model, which is more intervention. So we should be, that's one of the other things that should definitely yes. be changing is how the insurance plans for people work so that they can, that therapy is paid for. Because there's so many therapists that are out of network and people, they may be brilliant therapists and people can't afford to go to them, you know, and so that's another huge issue. Right. The reimbursements are often so low that the therapist can't survive and then they're out of network or there's, there's so many things that happen that make really no sense. I mean, I, I, I in- agree so enthusiastically with what you just said. And the, yes. the bio model reimburses versus the one that really works that in the long term is going to cost lots le- a lot less money. Yes. is not being reimbursed. So it's a complete distortion of the system. And I know that there's more and more people yes. aware of this. And so I'd love yes. to, as I said, do a part two, but thank you for your wisdom, your time, your welcome. energy, the book that you've written. Where can people learn more about you and where can they get your book? we will put all of this in the show notes. Sure. Th- thank you. Yeah, the, the book is available at most major bookstores and, and outlets like, you know, on Amazon and places like that. And, and there's a website that's just, it's Dr. Paul Conti, just D-R and then my name, D-R Paul Conti. And, and it has links to, to places where people can acquire the book. That's wonderful. And do you still practice? Are you currently still practicing? Can 
I do. I do. I have a clinic with with with, with there are about 20 of us, wonderful, like minded people I'm, I'm privileged to work with. And the, the clinic is Pacific Premier Group. And we all we have a website to Pacific Premier Group dot com. And and we work together and we, we come through the the understanding people as best we can to help them model of, model of approach. Wonderful. And that's in the West Coast. We are based in Portland, Oregon, and we, we extend out, you know, in many ways across the country and, and, and in other parts of the world. Yeah. Zoom technology, now people can also get access to your group. Yes. Intervention, fantastic. We'll put all those links in the show notes. Thank you so much for your time, and I'm very excited to talk to you again. Yeah, you're very welcome. Thank you so much for having me on. I so appreciate it. Thank you. I hope you found today's podcast interesting and helpful. If you want more tips and help with managing anxiety, depression, and mental health, be sure to visit my website at drleaf.com and to sign up for my weekly newsletter where I also include a schedule of my speaking events and so much more. And follow me on social media. I'm on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Just look for Dr. Caroline Leaf. Also, I love seeing all your posts on social media about this podcast. I love seeing what resonates with you and what you've learned. So be sure to continue posting and tagging me and letting me know what you think and how these tips worked out for you. And don't forget, leave a review and keep spreading the word about this podcast. Thank you for joining me today. I really hope you learned something new and helpful. Till then, I'm Dr. Caroline Leaf. This podcast represents the opinions of myself and my guests. The content here should not be taken as medical advice. The content here is for educational and informational purposes only. Please consult your healthcare professional for any individual medical questions you may have. While we make every effort to ensure that the information we are sharing is accurate, we welcome any comments, suggestions or corrections of errors.